Hello and welcome from the Corner Shop offices in Mexico City to this episode of Crossing Borders with Nathan Lustig, where I have conversations with entrepreneurs doing business across borders and the people who support them, with a focus on those with some connection to Latin America. My guest today is Daniel Unduraga, co-founder of Corner Shop, a grocery delivery application similar to Amazon Fresh or Instacart, which was just acquired by Walmart for $225 million. Originally from Chile, Danny has always been entrepreneurial. He co-founded Needish, a craigslist light platform where people could post what they needed instead of what they had to sell. After becoming one of the biggest websites in Chile, Danny and his co-founders couldn't figure out a business model, so they pivoted to Clan Descuento, a Groupon clone, which was acquired shortly thereafter by Groupon in the U.S. After Clan Descuento, Danny and his partners started Seahorse, a photo-sharing app, which didn't end up working out, and then went on to launch Corner Shop in both Chile and Mexico at the same time. We talk about lessons he's learned, the Chilean entrepreneurial ecosystem, and Danny's advice for entrepreneurs who are trying to launch and scale in Latin America. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Danny Undurak. Hey, Danny, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being willing to do it. Thanks for having me. No, of course, this, is, this will be fun. So where are we in the world today? We are in Mexico City uh, at our office, uh, Corner Shop office in Polanco. Yeah, thanks for hosting us. So tell me a little bit about Corner Shop. You guys have had some big news recently. Yeah, so Corner Shop is a grocery delivery service uh, that delivers in an hour. We work with all major supermarkets in Chile and Mexico. Uh, we launched the service three years ago, a little bit more than three years ago, and we have been recently acquired by Walmart, and we're super excited about what's uh, coming. So three years from starting to acquisition, that's pretty quick. Right. And what was that process like? Uh, it was uh, interesting, you know, we uh, didn't expect it. We were not uh, trying to sell the company either, and. And we started our conversations with Walmart uh, as commercial partners, uh, but they really liked what we were doing and the traction we had and the, and the service that we built. Uh, so the, the conversation quickly shifted from like a commercial partnership to an acquisition. And um, yeah, we were talking with them for like a year, you know, like speaking about the details and, and, and the way, the best way of doing this until we reached an agreement and we signed and announced this uh, around a month ago. And there were rumors that it was gonna happen like even six months ago that was in the press. How did that feel to see data starting to leak out and having people start to say, hey, is this really gonna happen in the press before it was ready? Yeah, it was um, kind of worrying because we, we work with other supermarkets, you know, and we didn't want to scare them away. So that I would say that that was the worst part. Um, and we never found out where the leak came from, so we still don't know. And but yeah, we were worried about our other supermarket partners more than anything. Uh, besides that, uh, we had to kind of um, talk to the team, you know, and say, "Hey, this is not true. We're not selling the company." And, and actually, it was true, you know, because you're don't you're not selling the company until you sell it, you know. And and we were talking with them. We also spoke with other companies, you know, and, and we were trying to race around at the same time. So it wasn't that we were lying to our team, but in the end, everything worked out well for us. So I'm going to jump into more on Corner Shop in a bit here, but I want to go back to you. Mm -hmm. So where are you from originally? I'm from Chile. And where in Chile? From Santiago. And where else have you lived in your life besides for Santiago? I lived in Barcelona in Spain. I spent... Uh, uh, a little bit less than a year there uh, studying music. Uh, then I lived in Mexico twice. I lived uh, when I was working for Groupon. We, we sold our first company or our previous company to, to Groupon and I was the first employee in Mexico. Um, and then I lived in Mexico again with Corner Shop two years, two and a half years uh, now. And also spent uh, almost five years in San Francisco between 2012 and 2016. And how has living across different countries influenced your view on starting companies and just your life in general? Uh, I think uh, it makes you uh, more open-minded, you know, and and feeling 
uh, a little bit like a foreigner in your own country. Now when I go to Chile, I, I see it with foreign eyes and I can see things that I probably couldn't see when I was living there uh, all my life. Um, so it's, it's great because you can uh, uh, raise your awareness uh, and raise your consciousness level, I feel, you know, because you, you see all the things that locals don't necessarily see, you know, because uh, you take all these things for granted. And when you start living in different places, you realize that there's no uh, just one way of doing things. There's not just one way of, of seeing things, you know, and so um, I guess overall it's a very enriching experience and I'm very grateful of having had that opportunity. What are some of the biggest things that you see now with your, your new foreign eyes when you go back to Chile that you wouldn't have seen before? How boring and conservative it is, you know, <laughs> and how everybody think, thinks the same and speak the same way and, and believe in the same things, you know, and, and how uh, few like different opinions are there, you know, and especially uh, in, in the ruling elite, you know, like the ruling elite, they are all the same. They all believe in the same. They all live in the same neighborhood in Santiago and they all go to the same uh, beach town on weekends, you know, and they all know each other and they all marry between them in the same social class, you know, so it's 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 kind of uh, they don't have a lot of uh, outside influence, you know, and and they they're basically all the same. And I think that's uh, that's not good for the country, you know, because um, we need more uh, different ideas and more uh, creative people and, and we need to have uh, people doing things differently, you know, like uh, disrupting what's going on. Yeah, I think that was the biggest thing that I had to get over from going to Chile the first time was just the massive divisions, both physically and mentally, of people in different social classes. Right. And the interesting thing that, so I was outside of Chile for six months this year and then came back and there's so much more immigration now. Yeah. Like I remember in 2010, um, there was a stat that we saw that said that only about three to 5% of Chileans had ever met a foreigner who wasn't Argentine, Bolivian, or Peruvian. Mm -hmm. Now 100% half because of Venezuela, Haiti, right. Colombia. Right. Uh, so it's, it's definitely getting sort of that kick that it needs, I would say. Yeah, that's great. And I'm hoping that more people from different countries will go there, you know, because we really need it, I think. Um, you know, like, uh, I I personally believe that part of, of Silicon Valley being uh, what it is, is that you have the best engineers and best entrepreneurs from all over the world uh, moving there, you know, and that's, that's great. One of, of the greatest things about living in San Francisco is the amount of people from all over the world that you meet with different religions, different backgrounds, different cultures, different uh, beliefs, you know, and and different values and and you can always learn something from from every one of these people you know and so um, I, I, I feel like Chile really needs something like that you know like more immigration more and also Chileans to go abroad more often you know and, and, and spend time there you know like most uh, Chileans that go abroad for, for studying, for example, they go, they spend a couple of years outside. They all they do is spend time with the other Chileans in the in the in the group, you know, and, and then go back to Chile, you know, and they never really get to know uh, uh, people from other places very well, you know. So um, I guess uh, that's one of the things that I could ch I would change in Chile if I could. Did you always know that you were going to be an entrepreneur from a young age or was it something that just came up during your career path? Um, I guess a little bit of both. I always wanted to be an entrepreneur because I didn't want to have a, a clueless boss telling me what to do and what not to do. Uh, I guess that was my uh, first uh, impulse, you know, in, in wanting to become an entrepreneur. Uh, but at the same time, I started uh, working with Juan Pablo, one of my co-founders at Corner Shop. When we were 18 years old, you know, and we were studying software engineer in Chile and classmates started asking, you know, hey, I have this cousin who wants to build a website and I have a, an uncle who wants to build this system for whatever, you know, inventory or whatever it was. And we started building all these things and learning and, and really enjoying what we were doing. And, and we started, uh, and then we started a company that did exactly that, you know, like software uh, factory basically it was a software factory and and that was my first company and 
and I didn't realize that I was an entrepreneur, but I already was an entrepreneur, you know, because I was doing this. And and then I I had this epiphany uh, when I realized that I really wanted to do that all my life, and and I really wanted to do startups, you know, like scalable businesses. You know, I was a software engineer, and I and one of the the great things about software is how fast you can scale a company. And, and I started looking for ideas that could be scalable really, really fast and, and, and understanding that there was this concept called a startup, you know, which is basically a fast growing venture. And back then when I started Niche, which was my first startup, I would say, with, uh, with the same two co-founders that I have at Corner Shop now, we've been working together for like 12 years, I think now. And, and when we started Nilish, which was our first startup, and we were trying to raise money, and we wanted it to grow like really fast, uh, nobody in Chile knew what a startup was, and nobody knew that you could like raise money for a startup, because back then, all businesses in Chile were PMEs, you know, like small businesses that um, were not funded, but rather were all bootstrapped, you know, like, you just start growing with the revenue that you can reinvest, and 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 those businesses r- rarely grow fast enough, so they could be considered a startup. You know. And what year would that have been, more or less? This was uh, in two thousand seven. And so, when you did go to try to raise money, were there actually funds, or was it going to just you know rich people that had money, or was it family offices? What was it like in 2007 in Chile? Oh, so there, there were no funds and what it was mostly a friend, family and fools, you know? So uh, no funds and, and angel, angels, you know, we found a couple of angels. Uh, the, actually, the, the person who helped us the most back then was Wenceslao Casares, an Argentinian who had sold his business for like more than 600 million, I think to Banco Santander uh, back in the day, you know, uh, before the bubble, uh, before the bubble burst in, in 2001. And and he was super helpful because he had a lot of um, connections and he was living in Silicon Valley back then and he was our, our first angel investor and he had helped us a lot and he was a great mentor, a great mentor back then. How did you meet Oscar? Um, how did I meet Oscar? That was a funny story because I, I, I was living in Barcelona in 2003, I think it was. And I had, uh, I lived with a bunch of people, you know, like we were all students. We, I think we were seven people living in an apartment in Barcelona. And one of my roommates was a German girl who wanted to come to South America, but she didn't know anything about South America. And uh, so she met me, you know, I was from Chile, so she told me, you know, like, I'm thinking of going to South America, and now that I know you, I would like to go to Chile, because then I can go to a country where I know at least one person. Uh, so uh, I came back to Chile, and she came um, uh, a while later, and and she was also sharing an apartment with a bunch of people, and one of the people that she was sharing an apartment with was Oscar. So I met Oscar as the roommate of my German roommate from Barcelona. <laughs> That's a really random way to meet. Yeah, totally random. And, and and then we became friends, you know, and we started going out together. And and then we started talking about doing something together. He went back to Sweden uh, and then we started a business like three years after, I think. So what did Needish do and how did it pivot into being uh, a Groupon club? So uh, Nidish was a website, a little bit like Craigslist, but where you posted what you need instead of what you were selling. And if you were a service provider, you could sign up and create an account and create what we called a, a need catcher and with keywords and, and, you know, like a polygon and a map and whatever. And you, if you, for example, are a piano teacher, you can subscribe to all people needing piano lessons. So if you're a piano tuner, the same thing, you know. And so people would write these uh, needs and the community could help uh, giving advice or giving tips, you know, or companies uh, could give you a, a quote, you know, like, hey, I can provide this service on such day and with this price and whatever. And... And that was it, you know, and it was kind of growing. We created a, a community uh, and we had a lot of 
users, you know, we had, we were one of the most visited sites in, in Chile, I think. And when we had a lot of businesses, we, we had like 15,000 business accounts or so, you know, uh, but we had a hard time monetizing this uh, website and we were not putting a lot of attention in the business model or, or at least we didn't do at the beginning. And we were more worried about uh, growing and having a lot of um, users and businesses because we thought that we that was the way of creating value. And maybe if we started charging for the service, we were putting a lot of friction. And so we, we were having all these dilemmas and, and we were we started running out of money. And, and then we saw Groupon. And this was when Groupon was in maybe one or two cities in the US. They were in Chicago and maybe Boston and, and maybe a, a, another one. And, and we started looking at them and we were like, dude, they have the same as we have. You know, they have businesses, local businesses, they have customers but they have a business model that's working great and it's providing a lot of value for both users and businesses, you know? So we thought that maybe if we created another website with the same users and the same businesses, uh, providing these uh, daily deals, you know, um, that were up to 50% off, which is super attractive for the customer, but it's also great for the business if you do it right. And we thought, why not, you know? And we started uh, with this Group on clone called Clan Descuento, uh, and at the same time we we kept Nidish, so we had both projects at the same time with the same company, and we launched. And I think the first day we sold like ten thousand dollars, one day. We were like, wow, you know, we already have like a three and a half million dollar run rate on day one, and if we can grow this, we were we can build a, like a really big company, and that was sort of the the epiphany, and we started like investing uh, a lot of uh, effort in growing that and it started growing really fast and we were thinking of launching it in Argentina and Mexico and yeah and I think it was like less than six months after we launched that uh, group on knocked on our door and they basically said you know we're going international we're going uh, to South America to Latin America and we either buy you or compete with you and we both agreed that it was better to work together, you know, because, uh, um, yeah, it made a lot of sense. You know, we already had uh, the technology, the users, and we were from there and they, and they were having a hard time finding people to do it in Latin America. So it made a lot of sense. I think the first event that I went to with Startup Chile was at your guys' office where you and Oscar told a little bit of the story. Mm -hmm. And one of the most interesting memories from that was that Beyond the Startup Chile people, there was a couple of Chileans who were also entrepreneurs who came and one guy asked the question, how will Groupon work where you're giving big discounts and the quote unquote wrong people will show up? So there's a huge cultural difference for a daily deals business. We've talked about classism before. Mm -hmm. What kind of barriers did you guys find in not even just classism, but culture for launching a Groupon in Latin America compared to what they found in the US? Um, I think that, uh, well, Groupon really worked very well in Chile, not so well in Mexico, so I prefer to, 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 to talk about the Mexican case. You know, when we launched in 2010 in Mexico, uh, like the, the percentage of the population that had credit cards was probably 20%, and that was, of course, the richest 20%. And, and Mexicans, like rich Mexicans, didn't like discounts because they think it's kind of tacky to show up in a restaurant with a discount or with a coupon, you know. So uh, we had a, a really, really hard time trying to get the concept into the Mexican consumer because um, because of the way the Groupon worked, that the deal would only activate if, en if enough people bought it. Uh, you needed to do it with credit cards, you know, like using authorization and capture is the, is the way that it, this is called with credit cards. You know, like we reserve that amount of money and we don't charge you until the tipping point is reached, whatever it is, you know, like 100 persons, 100 people, you know. And, and we had a, a lot of uh, problems getting this concept into the Mexican consumer, you know, and, and it was way, way harder than, than in Chile, for example, when in Chile, it's a little bit more like the US where nobody sees anything wrong with saving money or showing up with a coupon, you know, like I mean, saving money is good, you know, that, that's the, the, the concept in Chile. And, and in Mexico, it was uh, a lot different. In, and we had uh, to be really creative in the way that we marketed the service and, and in the way that we 
acquired users, you know, and 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 the problem that we had is that probably the market that would have enjoyed the, these coupons that we were selling the most, they didn't have credit cards and they uh, were used to do doing e-commerce, but in a very Mexican way, which is basically you print a receipt and then you go to the local uh, convenience store and then you pay uh, that receipt uh, at the cashier at the convenience store, you know, and which is very offline. So, but those were the kind of things that as a foreigner, I didn't really get. And I guess I still don't really get, you know, like, <laughs> but that's the way that most Mexicans did e-commerce back then and, that, and a lot of them still do. And so after going through the uh, Groupon experience, why did you decide to go to San Francisco? Because I was feeling, you know, like, hey, I already sold a company from Latin America to the US, you know, I, I sold it to an American company. And I thought that the likelihood of doing that again was really, really low. And I was like, I, I'm a software engineer, I'm a tech entrepreneur, I wanna keep doing this, and it's probably gonna be easier if I move there, you know, because there's more capital, there's more people trying to do the same kind of things, you know, and, and it's gonna be probably more easier, you know, and whereas if I stay here in Chile, uh, I'm probably gonna have a hard time uh, doing anything like this, you know. Uh, again, which is even more unlikely, you know, like doing it twice than once, you know. Uh, but, you know, like I moved to the US, I started this business called uh, Seahorse that didn't work. And then we came up with this idea of doing corner shopping in Latin America because we thought, you know, this is what we are good at, you know, like Latin America, e-commerce, you know, uh, tech. And, and we decided to start corner shop and it was kind of, it happened again what I what I thought that it was impossible, you know, that we sold a company from Latin America to an American company. And why Corner Shop rather than there were I'm sure lots of other ideas that you could have that you guys were evaluating or coming up with. Why yeah. why did you pick that one? Because uh, I was living in San Francisco and I was using all these services, you know, like uh, Amazon Prime Now, Google Shopping Express and Instacart and a bunch of others, you know that would deliver whatever I wanted in an hour to my home. And, and I was, and I just had my baby, you know, and I was starting to appreciate my, my time a lot more. And I was uh, realizing that as a consumer, what changed the most for, for me was that I was ordering more and more online. And one of the reasons that I was doing that was because I could get whatever I needed in an hour, you know, and, and when you can get whatever you need on demand, uh, your uh, behavior as a consumer changes a lot because uh, it's very different to order a supermarket basket or whatever you're ordering, you know, in, in an hour than two days. And, and if it was uh, in, in Latin America, you know, in Latin America, uh, in Chile specifically, the, I think the shortest that you could order from a supermarket online was two days. And of course, when, when you are ordering in two days, you order a very different basket when that, like if you have an emergency, you can, you cannot order online, you know, and, and we started with this concept of ordering in, in one hour because it was really disruptive and, and game changing, you know, uh, people completely shift their behavior and they started ordering more often and smaller baskets, you know, like when people order online uh, uh, in Chile two, three years ago, they were ordering, I think that the average ticket was $400, you know, because they were stocking up for like a month, you know, because they don't want to go to the supermarket and they were buying all the things to, to stock up at, at home. And and now with Corner Shop, people are buying whatever they need for, for today's dinner and, and whatever they need, uh, if they have an emergency, you know, or they need uh, an extra ingredient for, for what they're cooking, you know, and, and that really changes the, the paradigm, you know, and how people seize the service because they, they order more often and smaller amounts of stuff, you know. And when you were just getting started, you were still in Silicon Valley, what was the first step to being able to fund this? Did you talk to LATAM VCs, US VCs or both? Um, we actually we were, we were the first money came from us founders 
And then we made a small round, I think it was half a million with, with friends and, and, and family, you know, like angels that had invested in, in our previous company, people like that. And then I think that the first institutional investor was a Mexican fund called OBP. Uh, they invested in our second angel round and uh, but we met them in san francisco so part of the reason i guess they invested in us was that we were based in san francisco that we were living there and we had the connections and we were trying to raise money with american VCs. but we got introduced to this mexican fund and in san francisco and we met them there and they were interested and i think that was the first institutional money that we got and then um, they co-led our series a with uh, an american fund called jackson square ventures and, and then our Series B was uh, led by Excel Partners. And after the acquisition, both you and Oscar were on Twitter and in different media outlets talking about uh, the acquisition and funding. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of politicians and columnists and people like that in Chile that were talking about why no Chilean funds were involved. What was your experience with Chilean or even other Latin American funds compared to the U.S.? So uh, I guess our only experience in Cornishaw was with uh, this Mexican fund. They have been great and they have been super helpful and they were the first one to believe in us. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that we work with them in, in this company. And, and we had no Chilean funds basically because uh, most Chilean funds have this core for leverage and they cannot invest in companies that are incorporated outside of Chile, and they have all these uh, weird uh, and, and you know strange uh, rules in which in what they can invest and in what they cannot invest. And and we knew it was going to be uh, really hard to get money from a Chilean VC. So uh, we had a structure that was really hard for for a Chilean VC with core leverage to invest in. And, and we knew that, and, and so we didn't spend much time trying to get money in Chile, actually. And you've been able to raise both in Mexico and in, in the U.S., and there's a lot of other Latin American founders that would like to follow that path and be able to raise either in Latin or in the U.S. What advice would you give to founders on how to raise money? Um, so I would advise them to, if they especially if you're from a small country like Chile, you know, I think you should look your market as all of Latin America or hopefully global, you know, being a global company. Because Chile is too small and, and you have too many gatekeepers in the Chilean economy. You, you, you have to always be asking for permission, you know, in, in Chile. So I would advise people to incorporate their businesses in the U.S., and do all the paperwork in English uh, because it's easier to buy an American company than to buy a Chilean company. You know, like you can you can sell an American company to an American or to Chinese or a European, but probably a Chilean company you can only sell to a Chilean. You know, so and that changes everything. You know, when you have uh, your lawyers in Silicon Valley and your paperwork in English, then you as a founder start thinking differently about the scope of your business and 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 what your market is. You know. And, and so that would be my, my first advice. And, and then take it from there. You know, once you, you have everything in, incorporated in the US or an international uh, country, you know, then, then it's easier to see yourself as an international company or a global company. And, and then I think everything will, will fall in place, you know, along the way. One of the biggest, uh, niches of companies that apply to Magma asking for money are companies that are either direct copies of U.S. companies or companies that are similar but are taking a, a tweak on it. Mm -hmm. And you've been successful twice doing that. Right. What is some advice you would give to the founders that are trying to either copy exactly or do something similar with a tweak to be successful in that time? Yeah, I think uh, the hardest thing to get right when you're starting a business is the product market fit. And make sure that the, the problem you're solving is an actual problem that a lot of people have and are willing to pay for a solution. And and given that, you know, like you can take ideas from, from the US or, or, or maybe Japan or, or, or Europe or, you know, more developed markets 
um, you can take these ideas and implement them in, in Latin America with very low risk of not having product market fit. And it, it's great, you know, because then you take half the risk off the table and then you can focus your time and efforts and execution and fundraising and, and not on product market fit, which is sometimes really hard to get. Another, another one that comes up with founders is that many founders have the plan of launching in one country, getting some traction, and then launching in the next, getting some traction, launching in the next. Mm -hmm. But you chose basically Mexico and Chile more or less at the same time. Yeah. Why did you do that? And would you recommend that to other entrepreneurs? Yeah, at, at least I would recommend to think everything uh, since the beginning to be multi-language, multi-currency, multi time zone multi everything you know because it's really hard to get that right if you didn't think it right from the beginning you know so what we did uh, we, we launched at the same time in mexico city and, and santiago i think we launched three days before in mexico city and then and then in santiago uh, but we thought everything to be uh, you know like multi-language multi-currency uh, multi-city, multi-time zone, all the all the hard things about Corner Shop, uh, we did, uh, we thought to be multi-country since the beginning, you know, and, and, and it's a lot easier to get that right if you think it uh, since the beginning to be like that. Um, otherwise, uh, you can spend a lot of time and a lot of effort trying to launch your second market because you didn't have the support for different payment methods or different languages or different whatever it is that you need to do for your second market. And so, yeah, I think uh, we learned that while we were doing Clan Descuento in, in many countries and, and we did it right since day one with Corner Shop. One of the interesting things we see with companies is that Chileans will want to go, their second market is Peru. Mm -hmm. Peruvians generally want to go to Mexico. Colombia wants to go to Mexico. Mm -hmm. But Mexicans generally just do Mexico, um, right? Would you? What advice would you give to other Mexican entrepreneurs about why they should or shouldn't be doing another Latin American country at the same time? Well, the thing with Mexico is that it's so big that it, it might make sense to focus just on Mexico and do a Mexican company. When you are from Chile, you really need to be thinking about other markets because Chile has just one major city, and it's really hard to make a big company out of one city, you know. Uh, Mexico City alone is bigger than all of Chile and in terms of uh, population, you know, and in terms of GDP and all the things, you know. So um, even if, if you're Mexican and you're only in Mexico City, your, your, your addressable market is probably going to be bigger than a Chilean doing all of Chile, all of the cities and, and small towns in Chile. So. Uh, that's an advantage that Mexicans have or Brazilians have that Chileans don't have. You know, like you can, you can address just your home market and still be able to create a billion dollar business. I don't think you can create a billion dollar business if you are only in Chile. You know, it's, it's going to be really, really hard. So um, um, that I, I think that advice of going multi-country and multi everything applies more to people from smaller countries. You know, like Uruguay or Costa Rica, Chile. You know, Bolivia. And with Corner Shop, when you launched Mexico, Chile, um, how long did it take to get to an inflection point where you knew this is actually going to be a real company? Um, I think we knew pretty early on, you know, because we started growing uh, quite fast and especially because of the, you know, people were buying many, many times, you know, so they bought once on their first month and twice on their second month, three times on their third month. And, and at month, month six, you know, they were buying like four or five times. So we, we really saw there's something here, you know, like people are loving the service and people who, are, who keep using the service, they, they are using it more and more. So um, that was a pretty strong signal that we were onto something that could be successful. What's it been like personally and professionally to grow a company that's gone from zero to 225 million in an acquisition in three years? Has anything changed or is it all pretty much the same? Um, 
No, I think it's pretty much the same, you know, like we we keep doing what we have always done. We keep focusing on the details. I, I still send an email to every new customer in Mexico that I try to reply personally and get feedback from them, you know. So we keep doing things the, the same way, just uh, the scale has gotten bigger, you know, but um, but we try to keep focused on, on the little details and, and on the customer experience the same way that we did on the early days. And if you could, looking at the Latin American startup ecosystem, if you could make one change, say you were king for the day, mm -hmm. what, what change would you make either to the entrepreneurs ecosystem, to the investors? What would be something that you would want to think about making different? Um, good question. I don't know. I, I feel like in Latin America, we have great engineers. Uh, we don't have that many uh, great founders. So I would love if we had more founders, you know, because I feel like the engineering is there. We have great engineers that can build great products. Uh, we have uh, probably good product managers. What we don't have is is the founders that can, you know, like get all these things together to uh, to start a company from scratch and and turn it into a successful thing. And that maybe also have to do with uh, with investors, you know, like is historically we haven't had great. VC funds in Latin America. It's a, it's a, an industry that's getting started, and and we have a lot to learn. We still have a long way to go. I feel in the VC industry. So, and, and and this feels a little bit like a chicken and egg problem, you know, because we won't have great VCs unless we have great companies, and we have we won't have great companies unless we have great founders. So yeah, all these things have to grow more or less at the same time and, and, and develop at the same time. And, and, but I feel like we're, we're making a lot of progress. You know, we, we were talking before that um, there has been more uh, BC, how was it? Like we have more, more VC investment in the last six weeks than all of 2016. Right, right. So that's pretty impressive, you know, and, and, and that's a, a very strong signal that things are changing and changing fast and, and going in the right direction. So, so I guess we'll, we'll have to wait and see, but I'm hopeful. Yeah. I think that part of it is just more and more cases like, like you guys and like Movile in Brazil and right. Mercado Libre that you know, we, we talked about the, the Groupon Mafia and the Movile Mafia right. creating all the different companies and founders out of it. And I think it's just a matter of time. Right. And so what's next for you and for Corner Shop? So we're going to stay as an independent company within the Walmart family. And we are going to keep doing what we're doing. We're going to keep working with all supermarkets and hopefully adding new supermarkets uh, and more stores, you know, specialty stores and local stores like the ones we're working with. And, and I'm going to move to San Francisco. Uh, once this uh, regulatory process that we're going through now uh, finishes, uh, we're going through an antitrust process in both in Mexico and Chile. So we're waiting for that to, to be done. And then I'll be moving to San Francisco and we'll probably gonna create a headquarters for corner shop in San Francisco and, and run the company from there. So we're looking forward to it. That's awesome. And looking back, all the way to when you first started Neatish, knowing what you know today, what advice would you give yourself? Um, good question. What advice would I give myself? Um, I don't know. Probably um, have uh, more focus on on the business model, which was uh, what we failed at with Neatish. You know, we never found a good business model and. And probably be more pragmatic and with the ideas, you know, and, and with product market fits. So we were successful with uh, Clan Descuento, which was heavily based on, on the group on business model. And then with Corner Shop, which was heavily based on, on, on Amazon Prime Now and, and Google Shopping Express and Instacart, you know. So uh, as a Latin American entrepreneur, uh, it makes a lot of sense to take a look at business models that are working somewhere else and not necessarily be so creative. You know, when I started Nidish, I thought that it was all about creating something new that had to be completely new, that you have never seen anything like that before. And, and the value, I thought that the value was there. And now I can tell that the value is way more in the execution uh, rather than the idea. 
and you can somebody else can launch a, a company and you can see it and improve upon it and and maybe become better you know and with time i understood that google didn't invent search they just did it better and facebook didn't invent social networking they just did it better so with time i guess i learned that the execution is way more important than the idea and i i'm not as romantic as i was back then you know when i started this i thought that the idea was everything i didn't value much the execution and i thought that it had to be really original and really innovative and really unique and i probably realized with time that that's bullshit you know yeah i think that's great advice to especially latin american entrepreneurs that maybe get carried away with trying to do something that is disruptive and innovative and right instead of just saying if I just execute on something that works well, that could be just as disruptive or more right. because more people are going to touch it. But, right. uh, hopefully we can do a round two of this when you're in San Francisco. Sure. Uh, there's so much more that we can cover, but um, got to get going here today. It's been really fun to do a catch up. Uh, thanks again for being willing to do it. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks again for listening to this episode of Crossing Borders. I hope you enjoyed it. Please make sure to share it if you did as it's the best way for people to learn about what's going on in Latin America, direct from the entrepreneur's mouth. If you want to learn more about the Corner Shop story, check out Latin Lists, Corner Shop Coverage, or Federico Antoni's podcast, where he talks about the investment side of Corner Shop. Thanks to Anka and Sofia for helping with the podcast production, and thanks again for listening. Have a great rest of your day.